invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 this morning. We're going to finish a section that we started last week. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I just want to read verses 24 to 26, and if you're able out of respect for God's Word, please stand for the reading of God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 24, it says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, I pray that you would work in our lives. I pray, Father, that you would use your word for your honor, for your glory, and for your praise. Father, I pray that I would simply be your tool to proclaim the excellencies of Christ for your name's sake. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Kindness. Kindness is an important characteristic, is it not? If you look online, you can find all kinds of statistics about kindness. How often people perform kind acts. A poll found that 93% of Americans reported doing something kind in the past three months. Does kindness uh, impact mental health? A 2020 survey found that 63% of adults said that kindness improved their mental health. A survey of young people found that 93% said kindness helped them move forward in the past year? Does kindness uh, impact longevity? A Harvard University study found that helping others is one of the strongest, um, one of the, the strongest things that improves health and longevity. 85% of children learn kindness from their parents. A UCLA study found that people help unconditionally without needing to explain why. Its kindness is universal. A kindness test found that three quarters of people said they receive kindness from close friends or family quite often or nearly all the time. This is no surprise. A study found that people of older ages are more likely to be mostly kind than people of younger ages. Fascinating to know that kindness can reduce inflammation in the body, decrease blood pressure, Kindness is important, is it not? Last week, we began to look at these last three verses of chapter 2, and we saw the character of a bondservant, that is, a pastor. And then, two, we began to look at the pursuit of a bondservant. And this morning, I hope to conclude, thirdly, the resolve of a bondservant. And the question I submitted to you last week was, what kind of a bondservant are you? Or who is our master? I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I think it is important that I go a little bit back to remind you that that Timothy is a bondservant, right? He is to be a servant of Christ. He is to be in submission to his Lord. He is not to be argumentative. He is not to spar over words. And we started looking at verse 24. 
And we saw that the pursuit of a bondservant, verse 24 says, the bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged. And I found it fascinating that he is to be. He is to be characterized by these things. He is not to be one who spars over words. On the contrary, he is to be an individual that is kind to all people. But I also found it fascinating in my studies this week as, we, as I thought about Galatians. And you can turn there. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5.16, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In my studies this week, I became more convinced that this idea of being kind doesn't only apply to a pastor. It applies to everybody who claims their master is the Lord. You will be kind. This is not easy, is it? This is so hard. He says to be kind. It means to be gentle, to be tender. Last week I talked to you about being tender, like a mom cares for this newborn. This past week, I don't know if it was Cordell and Emily or just Emily, who drove to Denver. Obviously, she's going to go into labor going over bail, right? Yes. So we'll see if the baby comes today. But when that little baby is born, oh, how that mama loves that baby. Tenderly cares for them. Friends, how are you doing? How am I doing at, at, at showing kindness? He goes on in our texts. And he says there, being kind, able to teach, Patient when wronged. And then he tells us, verse 25, do it with gentleness. All of us are to be kind to one another. But I love how, how Paul adds this word in verse 25. He says to Timothy, as a pastor, you need to show these character traits. But then he says, you need to do it with gentleness. You got to be patient with people. Isn't that hard? It's hard for us to be patient with our kids, let alone those who are not our kids. We are to be kind. We are to be patient. This is the character of your pastor, your elders. But it's also the character of any believer. We are to be kind. We are to be gentle. I had a, verse, a lot of verses I wanted to take you to, but I chose not to do that this morning. But I want us to think about this idea of gentleness. It is even tempered. It's easy to get fired up, isn't it? I finished a biography on uh, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was willing to stand alone for the sake of doctrine, no matter the cost. When the Catholic Church challenged him, he said, no, this is what God's word says. 
And so, friends, as a pastor, it is my desire to have the character of being gentle, being kind to all, being level-headed. But when it comes to the Word of God, friend, I don't want to be even-tempered. I'm going to be dogmatic. I'm going to be forceful. The idea of gentleness, though, is hard. At least for me, it's hard. It's hard to be even-tempered all of the time. Because I do not want to be a pastor that just comes week after week and says, Here, here's God's Word. Do what you want with it. I want to be a pastor who, in my own life, gets beat up day in and day out as I read the Word of God, as I'm convicted, as I'm challenged, as the Lord pokes me with a cattle prod and says, grow in your walk with Christ, then my responsibility, I believe it, is then to share that with you. And I believe my responsibility. You come tell me after if I'm wrong. I believe my responsibility is to poke you with a cattle prod and say, I love you. Do it. Do it. I'm not a pastor to get lots of friends. I'm a pastor because I have one audience, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we come to situations, where there are difficulties, When somebody is maybe saying or doing something that is not true, it is my desire to be patient. It is my desire to be gentle. And the the, the best model that I could find, and I want to spend some time there this morning, the best example I can find of somebody who is able to teach is I thought about somebody who was not quarrelsome. When I thought about somebody who was patient when he was wronged, somebody who corrected those with gentleness. There's one person that came to mind. That's Jesus. Although Jesus was God incarnate, and at any moment he could have destroyed his enemies with a word or had at his disposal more than 12 legions of angels, He chose rather to submit to every indignity because that was his father's will for him in his incarnation. In 1 Corinthians, you can turn there if you desire, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the church at Corinth and he dealt with serious issues within the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says in verse 21, he says, What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? You see, when Paul was correcting the church on their bad theology, he did it with tenderness. He did it with this idea of gentleness. When the Apostle Paul was defending his apostleship in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 10, verse 1, it says this, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am meek, went face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. You see, Paul points his audience to the gentleness of Christ. Friends, this idea of gentleness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 23, he says, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. I openly admit, for me at times, there are times in my life where I'm not kind. And I'm not patient with those who have wronged me. And I certainly don't exhibit gentleness. But this is my desire. 
But I submit to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is to be your character traits as well if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. See, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all sinners. We all make mistakes. We all have goof-ups. But as brothers and sisters, we are to come to each other with tenderness. If you see Galatians 6, 1, if there is sin in my life, you are to come to me. Not go to others. Come to me. Tell me. Because I'm a sinner. Ephesians 4 talks about it. Colossians 3, all over in the Bible. I want to take you to a couple of passages here in just a moment. Let's, let's start. Well, let's go there right now. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 is a great chapter, but for the sake of time, I I can't read through all of it. But he says in verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Verse 10, behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Verse 11, like a shepherd... He will tend his flock in his arm. He will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. This is the idea of that word, gentleness. Jesus never defended himself. But it was interesting, but when they desecrated his father's temple, he made a whip and he beat them. Meekness says, I, I'll never defend myself, but I'll die defending God. Twice Jesus cleansed the temple. He blasted the hypocrites. He condemned false leaders of Israel. He fearlessly uttered divine judgment upon people. And yet the Bible says he was meek. Meekness is power used only in the defense of God. Let me take you to a couple of very, very familiar passages. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Listen to this model. Isaiah I'm going to read the whole chapter. Very familiar. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised. And forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed. For our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord 
has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. He, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. As he will bear their iniquities, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great. And he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Folks, this is our model of kindness and gentleness. One that was not quarrelsome. Two more passages. First Peter 1. First Peter chapter 1, very familiar verses, verses 18 and 19, just thinking about how Christ and how he lived his life, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Then he tells us down in 21, he says there, who through... Hold on a second. Go to chapter 2, verse 21. Here's the example. For you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Friends, do you all see that? That's our example. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. Have you ever had somebody say something about you? And you just sat there, right? Just looking at them. First response is defense, is it not? Maybe it's just me. That's my first response. Whoa, wait a minute, you're wrong. That didn't happen. Shut your mouth and listen. Wow. This is the the character of a bondservant. 
Let's quickly talk about 25 and 26. I think that's where I am. The resolve of a bondservant. Listen, listen to what he says. Our greatest example is Christ. But back in 2 Timothy. He says, do it with gentleness. Our example is Christ. And then he says, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Now, he says, correcting them. I think the best word for the idea of, of this word correcting, it, it means to, to educate or, or to rear, as in rearing a child through the teaching and discipline and the knowledge, skill, moral, social behavior, and other necessary facets of becoming a well-rounded and productive individual. Correcting those who are in opposition. The way this word is used, it's used in the idea of an educational training. For example, in Acts 7.22, Moses was educated in all Egyptian wisdom. Paul was thoroughly educated in the law of our fathers, Acts 22.3. Timothy is to teach gently those who disagree with him. In our text this morning. But it's fascinating. While the blasphemers Hymenaeus and Alexander. Require not gentleness. But harsh discipline. In order to be taught their lesson. In Titus 2.12. The grace of God in salvation. Also teaches us. To live. A pious godly life. I don't want to bore you with all of the scriptures where this word is used, but just get this, six times this word, correcting, it's used in the sense of to discipline six times. It it speaks of the actual act to be disciplined three times. Two times in our Bible, it it means to, to be educated. Two times, it means to educate, to rear, two times. Once in our text this morning, where he says correcting those who are in opposition, and then it's used again in Titus 2.12, where it says instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Paul says, Timothy, you need to be kind to all. You need to not spar over words. You need to be able to teach God's word. You need to be patient when you're mistreated. And he says, look, if people are wrong, you need to, with gentleness, correct them. Correct those who are in opposition. Those who are, maybe they're they're vocal about it. Maybe they're trying to argue about it. But he says, Timothy, as a pastor, you need to, with gentleness, take them to the Word of God. Show them the Word of God. This is so hard. Because guess what? Even as an elder, as the pastor, I'm still a sinner. I get impatient with people sometimes. Especially when I'm tired. But he says, Timothy, you need to correct those who are in opposition. It makes me think of one verse, in one verse only, in 1 Peter chapter 2. This... The application, I think, goes to all of us because we've all had things said about us that aren't true, right? 
It hurts when people make accusations against you. But a verse that I will never forget is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Peter's writing to those who are suffering, and he says in verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. And then he says, verse 12, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. He says, focus on living for God. Have a clear conscience. And Paul tells Timothy, he goes, Timothy, stick to the word of God. Don't back down on the authority of God. If if somebody comes to you and challenges you and it's contrary to what the scripture says, stick to the word of God. Just like Martin Luther did, right? He stuck to the text. And the hope is that they would repent If perhaps God may work in their hearts and and lead to repentance. That is a a change of the heart and the mind. But when this happens, it's not, it shouldn't turn into an argument. This is to be done with gentleness because there's a love for God and a love for each other. This is not a, with an attitude of my way or the highway. It's not the attitude of the pastor that says, listen to me because I know the Bible. No. The attitude is, let's listen to what God says. Let's work through the text together so that we can honor God. And the idea is that Timothy is right in his understanding because he's been pouring over, studying over the Word of God. And the hope is that as people are challenging him, as he's sharing the truth of God's Word, they come to their senses. They, they abandon their former dispositions. There's a radical change. In their understanding of the word of God. It's interesting that the word repentance, it denotes a a radical turning from sin to a new way of life oriented towards God. Doesn't it sound familiar? Because we use that word when we come to Christ. That's what it means. People say, well, all you got to do is believe in Jesus to be saved. Friends, that's not the Bible. Repent and believe. Our world says repentance is a work. No, it's not. It's a change of mind. That's what we did when we came to Christ. We repented. We have a change of mind. And we understand that our sin damns us to hell. The radical turning as we turn from our sin, we turn to the Lordship of Christ. Peter said to to Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8, Repent of your wickedness. In other words, turn from your wickedness. True repentance is proven by actions and fruitful living. We see that taught in Matthew 3, Acts 26. Paul expresses anxiety that he might find some in the Corinthian church who've not repented of their former sins in 2 Corinthians 12. Interesting, in Revelation 16, 9, you find those who experienced the plague of fire in the book of Revelation refuse to repent and give glory to God. This is the idea of this word in our text where he says, if perhaps God may grant them repentance. It, it's so it's so fascinating. I'll tell you what, I don't think there's any thing that's harder than studying God's word and trying to condense it 
to fit it into the time that I have to talk to you. It's so hard. It's so hard. Let's bring chapter 2 to a conclusion. He says that God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And then he says, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. The idea of that they may come to their senses, it means that they'll, they'll sober up. They'll sober up. Have you all ever seen those, those westerns? Where those guys go into the, uh, the saloon, right? And they get, they get all this beer and whiskey and, and they drink. And, and then you have these guys come in and they throw water on them and they smack them back and forth on the face. Have you all ever seen that? This is what I thought about. That these people will come to their senses. It's not a matter of pride where a pastor says, I'm right and you're wrong. No, the pastor says, I love God. I love God's word. I'm going to do my best to teach God's word, to model God's word. And if I'm challenged on the authority of God's word, we say, okay, let's go to the word of God together. Not literally, but it's like, psh, psh, open your eyes. Look at the word of God. I remember one time when I was here and I was opening God's word, somebody spoke out in the middle of the service and they stood at the back like this, just looking at me. And I thought, oh boy, it's going to get fun. And I walked back there and they said, Jake, you're wrong. I said, oh, okay. I said, let's get together. And about an hour later, they show back up and they said, Jake, this is what you said. I said, no, no, no. I said that if you don't believe in the incarnation of Christ, you are not saved. He said, Jake, you said that Mormons can't be saved. I said, sir, I never said those words. And he said, well, he took me to this passage. And I said, you don't know your Bible. And I took him to the verses. And I trust that I did it with patience and with gentleness. But I told him, I said, shut your mouth during the service. Talk to me after. Talk to me after. And I showed him the air of his understanding of God's word. Timothy is supposed to say, look, sober up. Get self-control. Come on, you need to understand the word of God. And then I could spend so much time at the end where it says you can escape the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. In other words, what MacArthur says, he says this idea of the snare of the devil, this is the deception. The deception is the devil's trap. He's clever. He's subtle, isn't he? Genesis chapter 3, do you remember? Adam and Eve, what did the serpent do? Hmm. Ooh, it's okay, Eve. Go ahead and take a bite of that apple. Ooh, he was clever. He was subtle. John 8, 44, it tells us that I think he's the father of lies. 2 Corinthians 11 says that he disguises himself as an angel of, of light. And what Paul says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, you are to be a bondservant of God. As I try to bring things to a conclusion this morning, two things. Who is your master? Who is your master? Who is your master? I pray it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Or is it Satan who's got you held captive right now? I'm going to end with this quick story. Robert Robinson, author of the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, lost the happy communion with the Savior he had once enjoyed. And in his declining years... He wandered into the byways of sin, 
As a result, he became deeply troubled in spirit, hoping to relieve his mind, he decided to travel. In the course of his journeys, he became acquainted with a young woman on spiritual matters. And so she asked him what he thought of a hymn she had just been reading. To his astonishment, he found it to be none other than his own composition. He tried to evade her question, but she continued to press him for a response. Suddenly, he began to weep. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, I am the man who wrote that hymn many years ago. I'd give anything to experience again the joy I knew then. Although greatly surprised, she reassured him that the streams of mercy mentioned in his song still flowed. Mr. Robinson was deeply touched. Turning his wandering heart to the Lord, he was restored to full fellowship. Who's your master? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time to look to the scriptures. I pray, Lord, you'd use these things for your honor and for your glory. Father, I pray that you would start first and foremost with me. And then, Lord, I pray that you'd work in the lives of each one here. For your name's sake. In Christ's name, amen.